Welcome to summon. Halloween. Of course, most people can tell that this holiday has pagan origin. Most of it comes from the Celtic Samhain, uh, but we do have plenty of Norse influence in this holiday as well, as some modern pagans mistakenly quote Alpha Blut as the Norse parallel to Halloween, which is of course related, uh, but really what we're talking about as the parallel for Halloween is Vetternatter. As you can all see on the calendar here right behind me, it has just passed. I've done some older videos on this holiday uh, uh, as well, uh, but today we're taking an even deeper dive into the Norse sources and looking how it fused with other Celtic traditions in the Middle Ages and how it developed into our Halloween celebrations of today. So to start off, Happy Norse New Year, as I will go over in a minute, Vetternatter, the full moon of October, is the Norse pagan New Year, and as usual, I have just dropped a Norse calendar with all of our holidays, with a brand new edition this year, it's a recipe book of traditional Scandinavian dishes uh, go, to go along with each holiday. It's a banner, like you see behind me, but you can also get a digital download for just $5, that's all on the shop now, and I'll maybe put a link uh, that you can get it right here. Um, on uh, YouTube below. And as you will see here uh, for Vetternatter, uh, listed on the calendar, there is an Alpha Blut and there is a Disa Blut as some of the practices that were done there. So sacrifices to the elves and to the Disir. In the sources, both of these are attested at this time of year, but they are also attested at other times. So to sum it up, um, one in one short sentence, Alpha Blut was just one tradition that was probably practiced at Vetternatter, but there were many other things that they did at this festival. So Alpha Blut is not the Norse pagan parallel to Halloween, Vetternatter would be. Um, so first, let's talk about the sources on Alpha Blut. Um, there are a few sources that go into this, uh, but remember these are written by Christian historians uh, quite a long time after the Viking Age, so they aren't uh, going into a whole lot of detail, um, but we can be certain about some things. Uh, first, the Alvid, or the Elves, uh, they are essentially ancestral spirits. They're probably only referring to the dead male ancestral figures, whereas the Desir are the female ancestral spirits or other, you know, heavenly divine spirits. Um, this is clearly told about in the tale of Olav Geistadolf, a Viking king Olav who died and was worshipped as an elf. Uh, here is where he's buried, by the way, uh, where I visited last year, right near my hometown in Norway. And I've done uh, other videos on further sources about the elves and even linguistic evidence confirming a lot of this. So Alpha Brut is simply a sacrifice or an offering to any dead male ancestral spirits in the family. The second source that tells us about this is a poem called Austria Visuj. And in here, uh, and by the way, these skaldic poems are the oldest and most reliable, and we can tell that from the language written. These were not written a couple hundred years after the Viking Age, but like many other uh, sources, they were actually written uh, during the Viking Age by real skaldic poets who lived. But in this poem, uh, a Christian skald is traveling through Sweden and looking for a farm to stay at, and nobody wanted to let them in their house and, uh, because it was a private ceremony they were doing, the Alpha Blut. It was reserved for the family, and it was also mentioned in this source very clearly that it was in the early winter, exactly where you expect it to be right around uh, Vetternatter and our month of October. So this time of year is where not just the Norse that the Celts and the Latin people and basically every culture in the world that celebrates these things, they believe the veil between our realm and the next is at its thinnest. So it's easier to connect with our ancestors at this time of year, so it's the perfect time for an Alpha Brut. However, Alpha Brut could be practiced at any time of year. In Koirimak Saga, it was done kind of randomly on the fly in order to heal a battle wound. Uh, and in here, it actually gives a very detailed account of exactly how to practice the Alpha Brut. You take a bull, sacrifice it on a hill on the family property where the elves dwell and redden the hill with its blood and you will be healed from your injuries. 
So Alpha Brute definitely could have been done at any time of year, but most logically it would be in the early winter, right where we are now. And I'm sure that rings a bell, you know, we don't do it so much today anymore, but we used to leave offerings and gifts out to our ancestors' graves at this time of year. They still do it today in Dia de los Muertos in the uh, Latin countries, uh, but we in Europe, uh, in the north of Europe, we used to sacrifice an animal, let the blood run down our ancestors' grave mound. This became very, very illegal when Christianity came into the north of Europe, uh, but we still left out treats on our ancestors' graves as recently as 200 years ago in Scandinavia. And there was a tradition where children would actually dress up and go around from farm to farm and collect gifts uh, from all the farmers in the area, all the families, uh, in order to gather everything and leave a communal gift into the uh, graveyard of the ancestors that lived there. Does that sound familiar? It just sounds a little bit like trick-or-treat. Uh, so this tradition is recorded in only a few very rural areas of Norway uh, up until the 1800s. You can read more about it in Våre Traditioner by Vega i Solheim. Great book. Um, and it's a great thing for us to do today as well. Uh, even if it's passed already, visit your ancestors' graves, leave something nice. And by the way, in the Scandinavian folk tradition, the elves uh, are said to like blood, uh, butter, and honey. Um, so just uh, if you are wondering about what to leave. Um, moving on to from Alphablut to Vetternater. Uh, which translates to winter night. It's also attested as Vetternötum in some sources, just different dialects. Um, and uh, that was one of the major turning points in the Norse calendar, marking the official start of winter. And this holiday was traditionally celebrated in late October around our modern Halloween. Uh, I and other great scholars like Andreas Zautner and Andreas uh, Neuberg have theorized that uh, Vetternater would have most likely been practiced on the full moon in our modern day of October and this was the start of winter and also the start of the new year. One reason we uh, think this is because uh, according to Inglinga Saga there should be a blut for a good year at the first day of winter. Of course it's natural to make a blut for a good year at the start of the year so that's, that's pretty certain uh, uh, in my opinion. Another reason uh, we think this is that the Germanic tribes believe the new day to be marked by the beginning of the sunset as recorded in Tacitus Germania in the first century. So it stands to believe that their uh, new year would have also started at the start of the winter when the sun is on its way down as well and also on the moon, the full moon, when the moon begins to wane on its cycle. Additionally, other evidence suggests that sacrifices or bluts often took place during the full moon and it was also likely when the new year and winter season began, not just for the Norse, but all Germanic peoples. For um, uh, example, Bede's Reckoning of Time from the 7th century um, and, and other Norse sources support the idea that the full moon was an important marker of the holidays in their uh, calendar. Also, Bede mentions that this month is called Blodmonath in Old English, Blood Moon, which means the exact same thing as uh, what the moon is called in our Icelandic calendar months at this time, uh, because that is the time when the pagans did all of their sacrificing of the animals. So this is definitely a common Germanic practice that we all did in pre-Christian times. We have hundreds of mentions of uh, Vetternatur in the Norse sagas. It is by far the number one most tested holiday that they celebrated. However, again, it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail about how they celebrated and all the most forbidden pagan practices they did, but we do know a few things from the sources. In Gisla saga, like many other sagas, a symbol was held at Vetternatur, which was basically a formal drinking ceremony in order to honor the ancestors and make toasts and swear oaths. So that was absolutely done at Vetternatur. In Viga Glum's saga, a symbol and also even a Disa Blut was practiced here, a sacrifice to the female uh, spirits. Uh, there is more evidence that Disa Blut was done in March time, actually, uh, but definitely this source definitely confirms uh, that uh, a sacrifice to the Disid and female ancestral spirits was done uh, at this time of year in October as well. Also in the Gisla saga, 
uh, host blut was done. Uh, a blut for the harvest and of course a sacrifice to the fertility god Freyr. Uh, so that's very clear from this source that a host, host blut was done here. However, in Scandinavia, this is far too late uh, for a sacrifice to bring a good harvest. You know, when we're talking mid to late October, the harvest in Scandinavia would have been done one to two months ago. So on my calendar, I put the house blot uh, one moon before Vetternatter in September. But that's just me. But at least in that source, it's, uh, house blot could have been done. But you never know. That could change depending on where you live. If you're in a warmer place, the harvest season could very well have gone late into November. So you can do your house blot uh, whenever you want really if you're a farmer um, other than that vetternatter it was all kinds of partying and merrymaking it was a three-day feast and festival with plenty of drinking as told in many of the sagas there may also be some weddings held here as was done in the Luxterla saga uh, there is also a theoretical initiation type ritual that we think happened uh, young men initiates going out into the wild on a deeply sacred hunting ritual in order to kill bears and wolves or boar and wear the pelts to become berserkers. We find traces of this ritual all over the Indo-European world and these men were called the Koryos. But they have parallels in almost all European uh, cultures and even cultures in the East. I've done videos on all those sources you will find here. And uh, this is pri probably why even today we still associate werewolves and other scary creatures with Halloween. Uh, to finish the video, we have to speak about the blending of traditions. Over time, the Norse and Celtic traditions began to mix, especially in places like the Isle of Man where Viking settlers and the local Celts lived together, uh, and even to a large degree in Ireland as well where Vikings settled in large numbers. Uh, the Celtic traditions of Samhain and the Norse Vetternatter would have fused it into each other. Both cultures shared a belief in the thinning of the veil in between worlds, and both had similar traditions of honoring spirits and ancestors around this time of year. There were offerings left out to the fairies and on the graves of ancestors in Samhain, just as was done in Norse Alphablut. Grave mounds were opened in some of the oldest Celtic sources that we have, and many of these Neolithic tombs actually align with the sunlight at this exact time of year. Divination was also practiced in the Celtic Samhain in order to give prophecy for the coming year. Uh, Orsgang would uh, be a Scandinavian parallel uh, for this, which was a yearly walk that they would take, either at the solstice or December 31st, according to the later on Scandinavian folk tradition. But of course, if it was in pagan times, their new year would be right around now, and this would have been done in October, and they would have done Utiseta instead of Orsgang, because Utiseta became illegal uh, when Christianity came in, and that was, of course, because it was to wake the spirits of the dead to ask for wisdom and prophecy, very forbidden in the Christian uh, view. Uh, the Celts, they also did the pumpkin carving. Um, they used to carve uh, turnips, which they called jack-o'-lanterns, uh, with the Irish name uh, in origin. They did this to ward off evil spirits, but when they migrated to the U.S., they brought this tradition with them, and they found out that pumpkins, which are native to the U.S., were much easier to carve than little turnips. Uh, we don't have any Norse parallels to this practice, uh, but it did originate in the Isle of Man, where it was predominantly Vikings who settled, so it's very possible that all of these traditions go back thousands of years, although we don't have records of them going back that far, of course, uh, because they were pagan things and the Christians would have really hesitated to write them down. But guys, these traditions are not Christian. <laughs> Very few of them are made up in modern times by the candy companies. It's the reason we do all these things around Halloween and the reason it's so important to us is because of the ancestral memories inside of us that inspire us to continue these very old traditions. That's why it's my favorite time of year. So that's all I have to say for today. Happy New Year. And um, yeah, we will make another video at the uh, solstice or Yule, which is coming up in a couple months. So that's all for today. Here's the